By 1995, while Rare was already busy with development on many different franchises, Tim Stamper had begun production on a new game with the core team from Donkey Kong Country. While the next Donkey Kong Country game was being worked on by another team, Tim Stamper was leading the original team to design what was planned to be Rare's greatest game for the Super Nintendo. The project was considered top secret and no one outside of the team knew of its development. David Wise was first appointed to work on the audio for the game. While working on the sound design for GoldenEye, composer Grant Kirkhope was visited by Tim Stamper and Greg Mails, another game designer at Rare. After hearing his work on GoldenEye, Grant Kirkhope was soon appointed to work alongside David Wise on the new project. This top secret game would come to be known by its codename, Project Dream. Based on initial impressions within the company, Project Dream was designed to be a big step up from what players had seen with Donkey Kong Country on the Super Nintendo. Tim Stamper and Greg Mails played a lot of LucasArts adventure games like Day of the Tentacle, Full Throttle, and The Secret of Monkey Island. They became fans of the music and how it was designed to fade between different tracks depending on the location of the player. While designing Project Dream, Tim Stamper wanted the game to be very theme-based, so each character could be recognized by the player when they heard just a few notes from their theme music. He also wanted to have spoken dialogue for the game, something that would have been very difficult to create on the Super Nintendo. Eventually, the game was considered too big for the console and moved over to the Nintendo 64, where it was planned to use the system's disk drive expansion currently undergoing development. Around this time, David Wise left the project to begin working on Diddy Kong Racing with Chris Stamper, leaving Grant Kirkhope solely in charge of the game's sound design. Project Dream was originally designed to be a large-scale role-playing game similar to The Legend of Zelda and would star a boy named Edison who wielded a wooden sword and battled a group of pirates led by the Captain Black Eye. Edison would supposedly have a girlfriend named Madeline and be joined by a large and colorful cast of characters. During its development, Grant Kirkhope had reportedly written 107 different songs to be used in the game. Unfortunately, technical issues persisted during Project Dream's development, making the game unable to run at a suitable frame rate. After going back and spending time to redesign the entire game engine, Tim Stamper grew tired of the game's boy hero premise and decided to change the protagonist into an animal. Once Edison was removed, a rabbit was first considered as the new main character and later a dog until it was changed into a honey bear who was initially a secondary character in the original Project Dream. The bear was given a backpack which was inspired by Greg Mails' trip to Japan where similar backpacks are worn by Japanese children. He was also given a sidekick in the form of a red crested Briegel who was also originally a secondary character in Project Dream. Still, Tim Stamper was not satisfied with the direction Project Dream was going, and after being impressed with Super Mario 64, he decided that the project should become a return to Rare's platformer heritage. So, the idea of creating a role-playing game for Project Dream was scrapped and transitioned into creating a platformer starring the bear and the bird. Greg Mails was placed in charge as the producer and lead designer, George Andreas served as the senior designer, and the character designs were provided by Steve Mails, Greg Mails' brother. Following Tim Stamper's original plan to name the characters after musical instruments, the pair would come to be known as Banjo and Kazooie. Um, uh, I was actually working on the game for uh, 18 months before we decided this isn't, this isn't working out, rather than probably taking the um, easier option of finishing it and just getting out of it. No, we, we want to do something that is, is going to be remembered or is different or that we're going to be proud of rather than just finishing something for finishing sake. And it had, a, it had a bear in it called Banjo and we just basically thought this, we can do something with this character. So we basically took the character out of the game and wrote about the bear and put it into the, uh, the game that everyone knows as Banjo-Kazooie. So the 18 months didn't, <laughs> wasn't a complete waste of time. We did, we did get some uh, bits and pieces from it. The game was reintroduced to the world as Banjo-Kazooie at E3 1997 in Atlanta, Georgia. Banjo-Kazooie was heavily marketed by Nintendo as being the successor to the Donkey Kong Country franchise on the Nintendo 64 in terms of its graphical advancements. It was originally planned to be the big holiday game of 1997 with a scheduled promotional tie-in with Taco Bell, but the game had to be delayed for several months. So, Nintendo's big holiday game for that year became Rare's other game, Diddy Kong Racing, which featured Banjo as a playable character. Leading up to its release, a select group of people received a promotional videotape featuring a sneak preview of the game. First, there was Donkey and Diddy Kong, then Diddy and Dixie, Dixie and Kitty, Mario and Yoshi. Okay, okay, you get the point. So what's the big deal? Well, listen up. 
because there's a new dynamic duo from the creators of Donkey Kong Country and GoldenEye that's ready to kick some serious excitement into Nintendo 64. It's Banjo-Kazooie, the coolest headbanging, beak-busting, sky-flying, rock-hopping, egg-shooting, tag-teaming duo in a new game with so many thrills, chills, spells, and splats, you won't be able to put it down. They may not be the Cape Crusaders, but they're twice the fun, so what are you waiting for? The bat sign? Banjo-Kazooie, that's the name to remember. The best new game since Donkey teamed up with Diddy. Coming June 29th, only from Nintendo and Rare. Check it out now at your nearest Nintendo retailer. Don't delay, or you might be the one left standing there with egg on your face. Banjo-Kazooie would finally be released worldwide in the summer of 1998. The story of the game begins when a wicked witch named Grantilda claims to be the most beautiful woman, but when she discovers that the title actually belongs to Tootie, Banjo's sister, she decides to capture Tootie and steal her beauty for herself. It is then up to Banjo and his sidekick Kazooie to enter Gruntilda's lair, rescue Tootie, and defeat Gruntilda. Banjo-Kazooie was an action-adventure platformer game that was heavily influenced by Super Mario 64 and had a similar structure. The player would explore Gruntilda's lair, which granted access to nine different worlds. These included Mumbo's Mountain, Treasure Trove Cove, Clanker's Cavern, Bubble Gloob Swamp, Freeze Easy Peak, Gobi's Valley, Mad Monster Mansion, Rusty Bucket Bay, and Click Clock Wood. Each world contained 100 musical notes and 10 golden puzzle pieces known as Jiggies for players to collect after completing various challenges. One challenge that would grant the player a Jiggy in each level was finding 5 different colored Jinjos, creatures who had been imprisoned by Gruntilda. Collecting Jiggies and musical notes would allow players to access each subsequent level in the game. In many of the levels, Banjo and Kazooie would interact with their friend Bottles the Mole who would teach them new moves to use in the game, and Mumbo Jumbo, a shaman who could transform them into various creatures in exchange for Mumbo tokens. Other important items the players could collect in the game included blue eggs for ammunition, red feathers to fly with Kazooie, gold feathers for invincibility, honeycomb pieces to restore or maximize energy, and Banjo statues for extra lives. Special types of shoes could also be worn for a temporary period of time to cross a hazardous terrain or move at a faster speed. Along with providing various challenges that would test fans of the platformer genre, something that made Banjo-Kazooie stand out for many players was the game's general sense of humor which was seen in the personalities from many of the characters. While Banjo was normally polite and well-mannered, Kazooie would always come off as rude and sarcastic to the other characters in the game. Gruntilda would constantly taunt the duo throughout the game, all while speaking in rhyme. Each of the characters would speak with looping voice-like sounds, a design choice made due to the Nintendo 64's memory limitations. These speech-like sounds were actually provided by the designers at Rare, including Chris Sutherland as the voice of Banjo and Kazooie, Grant Kirkhope as Mumbo Jumbo and the Jinjos, and Chris Seaver as Gruntilda. The soundtrack for the game also proved to be very memorable for players. While Project Dream would never be made, Grant Kirkhope was able to reuse many of the songs originally created for that game, something that would carry over in many of the future games he would work on. Since the music was originally composed for a role-playing game, Grant Kirkhope had them rearranged with a more humorous approach in mind. His experimentation with the soundtrack having a more oddball style eventually became the signature sound for Banjo-Kazooie. Being a fan of the LucasArts Adventure games and its sound design, Banjo-Kazooie had a similar feature in how the soundtrack was continuous and interactive, in that it would dynamically change between tracks to reflect the condition or location of the player. The soundtrack was released on a limited edition CD by Nintendo of America, along with an exclusive bonus version by Best Buy and Nintendo Power Magazine. Banjo-Kazooie proved to be highly successful at its release. The game was praised by fans and critics for its fun and varied gameplay, endearing cast of characters, and how it served as an evolution to the 3D platform game formula that was previously established by Super Mario 64. The game sold well over 3.5 million copies worldwide, making it the 10th best-selling Nintendo 64 game of all time. 
Banjo-Kazooie was nominated for four awards at the 1999 Interactive Achievements Award, including Game of the Year, and ended up winning for Best Console Action Adventure and Best Art Direction. Many believe that Rare had created yet another system seller for Nintendo, in the same way they previously did with Donkey Kong Country and Goldeneye. Rare had another successful franchise on their hands, as well as a new pair of mascots. With their well-earned success, a follow-up to Banjo-Kazooie was surely expected, but this was something actually already suggested at the end of the game. After defeating Gruntilda and collecting all 100 Jiggies, during the final scene of the game, Mumbo Jumbo reveals to Banjo and Kazooie that there are secret colored eggs and a key made of ice that players could collect in the game through a feature referred to as Stop It Swap. However, this feature was stated as only becoming available by playing the game's sequel, Banjo-Tooie. In the year 2000, Rare followed up on their promise and released the highly anticipated follow-up to Banjo-Kazooie during the holiday season. Along with many of the designers from Banjo-Kazooie, Greg Mails returned and was in charge of game design alongside Steve Malpass, who served as a tester on the first game. Banjo-Tooie takes place two years after the events of the first game, with Gruntilda still trapped underneath that boulder. One night, when Banjo and Kazooie are playing a game of poker with friends, Gruntilda's sisters Mingella and Blabelda arrive in a large digging machine and remove the boulder to reveal a now skeletal Gruntilda. Her first action is to create a magical blast to destroy Banjo's house, which results in the death of Bottles the Mole. Banjo and Kazooie then decide they must stop Gruntilda's plans for a complete restoration of her body. They enter the Isle of Hags, which consists of brand new areas like the Jinjo Village and the Jiggy Wiggy Temple, the latter of which grants the pair access to each of the new levels in the game. These included Mayhem Temple, Glitter Gulch Mine, Witchy World, Jolly Rogers Lagoon, Terry Dactyl Land, Grunty Industries, Hailfire Peaks, and Cloud Cuckoo Land. The sequel followed a similar formula to Banjo-Kazooie, but expanded upon practically every single aspect of that game. Unlike the first game, which consisted of a hub world with separate different levels, these new levels were not only larger in Banjo-Tooie, but they were also interconnected with each other. There were numerous hidden paths within each world that would offer different methods of access to a level and new challenges related to this design. Each of the levels also had large boss battles and new mini-games that could be played as a separate multiplayer mode. Instead of learning the same moves from the first game, Players had all the moves from Banjo-Kazooie available to them from the start, and were taught new moves on top of them thanks to Jamjars, the military brother of Bottles. Banjo would now be able to separate himself from Kazooie, and they were each able to learn their own unique moves. Many of the collectible items returned with more variations, like different types of ammunition eggs. Mumbo Jumbo was now a playable character and had new shaman abilities available to him. Banjo and Kazooie would now receive transformations from Humbo Wumba, a Native American shaman and rival to Mumbo Jumbo, who could not only transform the duo into animals, but various objects as well. With so many options and features already crammed into the game, one of the strangest omissions from Banjo-Tooie for many players was the stop and swap feature that was mentioned at the end of Banjo-Kazooie. Rare had previously hinted that players would be able to access special areas and items in Banjo-Kazooie by completing certain tasks in Banjo-Tooie. While there were similar looking items that players could discover in Banjo-Tooie, they would only unlock some additional moves in a multiplayer character. In 2001, a pair of hackers from the fan site Rare Witch Project discovered that players were able to obtain the aforementioned colored eggs in Ice Key not just through an unofficial cheat device, but through in-game codes that could be entered by the player inside Treasure Trove Cove Sandcastle. In 2004, a patent filed by Rare revealed that Stop and Swap referred to the player removing the Banjo-Tooie cartridge from the Nintendo 64 while the system was still turned on and quickly replacing it with the Banjo-Kazooie cartridge. Utilizing the rhombus memory in the Nintendo 64, game information would be retained momentarily and transferred to the other game. In 2008, in an interview with a lead software engineer at Rare, the Stop and Swap feature had to be removed due to a revision made to the Nintendo 64 systems. In the older versions, players had a time span of 10 seconds to swap cartridges, while the newer versions of the console had reduced the time to only one second, rendering the feature useless. When Banjo-Tooie was released for the Nintendo 64, it was met with high praise similar to its predecessor by fans and critics. While many were impressed by Banjo-Tooie's ability to build upon and increase all of the features and visuals present in the first game, the game received some criticism for pushing the Nintendo 64's limit to an extent where it became detrimental to the game's frame rate. With the much bigger environments in the game, and the player's need to swap between more characters to complete most of the challenges, exploring the levels had a tendency to become needlessly difficult and tedious. Banjo-Tooie sold less than half of what its predecessor managed, with just under 1.5 million copies worldwide. 
While this was only enough to make Banjo-Tooie the 36th best-selling Nintendo 64 game of all time, this was considered reasonable since the game was released near the end of the console's life cycle where new games tend to suffer from a depreciation in sales. Banjo-Tooie managed to receive a nomination for the Moving Images Award at the 2000 BAFTA Awards and three nominations at the 2001 Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Awards. Just like with the first game, the ending of Banjo-Tooie hinted at the next follow-up to the franchise. But this next successor in the Banjo-Kazooie franchise would take on a different direction that came as a result of significant changes occurring at Rare. At the Nintendo Space World event in 2000, there was a released video featuring a tech demo of what the next Banjo-Kazooie game would look like running on the hardware of Nintendo's next console, the GameCube. In the following year at E3, it was revealed that Rare would be developing seven games for a Nintendo's Game Boy Advance. One of them was a game from the Banjo-Kazooie franchise with the subtitle Grunty's Revenge. But by 2002, Rare had been purchased by Microsoft, which meant that the company was now a first-party developer for Microsoft's Xbox console. However, since Microsoft didn't have a competing handheld system, Rare was still able to develop games for Nintendo. But with the recent buyout from Microsoft, it was unknown if Nintendo would still publish Rare's original games. Many were unsure if these games were even still in development. It wouldn't be until early 2003 when news broke that all of Rare's original games for the Game Boy Advance would be published by THQ. Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge, Rare's first game after being purchased by Microsoft from Nintendo, was released in September of 2003 in North America and a month later in Europe, but it would never see an official release in Japan. The game was designed by the newer team at Rare and originally meant to serve as a sort of alternate reality to the events that occur in Banjo-Tooie, but later it was revised to instead take place between the two Nintendo 64 games. With Gruntilda still trapped under a boulder following the events of Banjo-Kazooie, her minion Klungo builds a mechanical body for her spirit to possess. With her newfound body, Gruntilda captures Kazooie and travels back in time to prevent the duo from ever meeting. With the help of Mumbo Jumbo, Banjo travels into the past as well to rescue Kazooie and stop Gruntilda once again. The game's design and structure was very similar to its N64 counterparts, but was played from an isometric overhead perspective which gave the game a more 3D feel. Banjo would come across other characters both new and familiar to fans, partake in new minigames, and collect similar items and treasures along his adventure. Perhaps due to the limitations of the Game Boy Advance, players could only obtain 60 jiggies in total and gain access to 5 new levels. The soundtrack featured many familiar tracks, as well as some new compositions by composer Jamie Hughes. Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge was well received by fans, but since it had a relatively low profile release and little promotion from THQ, the game never became as successful or popular as prior games. While those who played it may have been disappointed by the game's short length, some of them were probably let down more so when it was later revealed that the game could have been longer than what they got. Another version of the game was released on mobile phones, but were produced by a different developer and was known more for being an exploitation of the license than a true entry in the series. Players received another game in the Banjo-Kazooie series on the Game Boy Advance in the form of Banjo Pilot. The game was released in early 2005 in North America and Europe, yet it was once again not given an official release in Japan. Originally intended to be a sequel to Diddy Kong Racing, Banjo Pilot featured characters from the Banjo-Kazooie universe as playable racers in tracks based on many locations from the prior three games. It featured the same types of race modes and multiplayer options seen in other kart racing games and a soundtrack composed by Jamie Hughes and Robin Beanland. Reactions to Banjo Pilot were mixed, with some players enjoying the features offered, while others were starting to lose interest in the genre and the franchise. After Banjo Pilot, fans were growing tired of these spin off titles for the franchise and wanted a true successor to Banjo Tooie to be developed for Microsoft's console. While there was no word of a new Banjo-Kazooie game for the Xbox, it wasn't long until players learned of a new Banjo game coming to Microsoft's next console, the Xbox 360. In September 2006, at Microsoft's X06 media briefing in Barcelona, Spain, there was a trailer teasing a new game from Rare featuring the Bear and Bird duo. Nothing substantial was revealed about this game other than its new angular character design seen with Banjo and Kazooie, and that it would feature the same item collecting that fans have become familiar with. The most the developers at Rare were willing to say at the time was that the new game would feature the same world and characters, but given that it's already been so many years since the last Banjo game, they wanted to design a game fans and newcomers could appreciate. However, in 2007, there was no word on the game's development and no presence of the game at Microsoft's press events for the majority of the year. There were anonymous reports and rumors that the game may have been cancelled. 
Unfortunately, Rare and Microsoft announced that the game was nearing completion and plans to be released as one of the big holiday titles of 2008. The team developing the new Banjo game consisted of many of the veteran designers at Rare who previously worked on prior Banjo games, including Greg Mails and Steve Malpass. Um, I, I was in 2E. Uh, Greg the design, was the designer of the original 2 and is designing this one as well. Uh, we've got Steve Mills, who's our lead character artist, and this was the lead character artist on the other two, and our lead background artist as well was the same, so quite a few people. According to an interview with Greg Mails, the initial plan was to have the game start as a complete remake of Banjo-Kazooie, but feature dramatic changes that would result in a sort of retelling of the first game. The second idea for the game was to make it a familiar platform game, but have the player possibly view the perspective from Gruntilda as she follows Banjo and Kazooie around on their adventure. Over time, Greg Mails felt that simply designing just another platform game in high definition would come off as feeling a little stale. When we started thinking, let's do a, a banjo game, we were thinking, you know, three, four, five years ago, what we're going to do, what we're going to do, what we're going to do, and we kept saying, I'll tell you what we're not going to do, what we don't want to do, and that's just a high def banjo kazooie or two. While the fans would surely be fine with more of the same, he felt that another banjo game in that similar vein was not something viable enough on the Xbox 360. He wanted to create a game that featured the elements that made the first two games beloved by fans, but also breathed new life into a genre sadly neglected for many years. We wanted to take a different approach to platform games. Um, we kind of looked at how traditional games have been approached that the designers create the abilities, we give them to the player, and the player can only use the abilities as we've defined. Right. Whereas we thought, can we approach that from a different direction, whereas the players actually get to define their own abilities so they can choose how they want to complete whatever task they've been set and then suddenly we had this concept sitting here this this kind of idea of approaching platform games from a different direction and then we kind of brought the two together right. and the result is the uh, new banjo game it came from a very simple idea of wanting to combine um, pieces with different abilities but the, uh, the beauty of the concept was the player could combine those pieces in any order they wanted to. Mm. And then at the end of it, whatever they created, you'd, you'd put into the game and it would just work. But the player wouldn't need to um, kind of calculate very complicated processes. The software would do that and no matter what you built, the size, the weight, the shape, you'd be able to put it in the game and it would just work. But until until Xbox 360, we've never had a piece of hardware that's been capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's where the idea in its infancy came from. So, the third and final idea would feature Banjo and Kazooie in an adventure that revolved around a vehicle creation system used to solve various challenges. Originally known under the working title Banjo Buildy, the next Banjo game would come to be known as Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. Along with its official announcement, it was revealed that both ports of Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie would be coming to Xbox Live Arcade with a new high-definition resolution and graphical refinements. Not only that, but the once-defunct stop-and-swap feature would be put back into the game as well as work in conjunction with the new game. Nuts and Bolts was released on the Xbox 360 on November 11, 2008 in North America and the following weeks in Europe, Australia, and Japan. Once upon a time, there lived a heroic bear called Banjo, a rather loud bird called Kazooie, and an unpleasant witch called Gruntilda. When Banjo's sister was kidnapped, the bear and bird rescued her from the depths of the witch's lair, overcoming many perils and speech impediments to send Gruntilda tumbling to her doom. But she was nothing if not persistent, and surprising nobody, the old hag soon rose from her grave for round two. Our brave heroes once again stood in her way, and this second showdown ended just as badly for Gruntilda, who really should have quit while she was ahead. Many years have passed, and peace reigns in Spiral Mountain. So what became of the bear, the bird, and the witch?
The game takes place eight years after the events of Banjo-Tooie, where Untilda's body had previously been destroyed, leaving behind only her head, while Banjo and Kazooie have grown fat and lazy by their long-time vacation. When the three meet and are about to face off, they are met by the Lord of Games, creator of all video games, who transports them to Showdown Town to compete in a series of challenges across multiple worlds. Gruntilda is given an artificial body, while Banjo and Kazooie are restored to their peak physical condition. Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts focused less on traditional platform elements and more on a new vehicle creation mode. Instead of players having access to Banjo and Kazooie's past movesets, something they had lost at the start of the game, they would have access to over 1,000 vehicle parts to design any kind of vehicle they wanted from scratch. We just felt that we needed to evolve uh, the franchise somewhat. It's still a very much a Banjo game, it's just that we've essentially removed Kazooie's moves and introduced the vehicle components. Um, but we're hoping that when people get to play it, the either old fans of Banjo or new ones are going to love it all the same. You've got the humour, you've got the characters, you've got all the little um, incidental, the pickups, the jiggies, um, and essentially it is still really like an old game. The vehicles themselves are like characters too, so all the moves have just moved on to them. These custom made vehicles could then be used to complete different types of challenges. This allowed for a lot of variety in how players could complete the game's objectives based on the vehicle they used to do so. What we're trying to do is keep the challenges as simple as possible, the actual objective of the challenge as simple as possible. What we want the player to do is look at the challenge in a completely different way, so the obvious isn't always the best solution. The creation tools at the player's disposal enabled them to control every aspect of their vehicle. Players would have control over a vehicle's handling, speed, ammo amount, fuel capacity, durability, and whether it could operate on land, sea, air, or all three. You build your vehicle out of blocks. Um, you have some very simple basic blocks that are sort of fillers, so to speak, to give strength and structure. Uh, they come in various different classes, which affect the, the weight of them and the strength of them as well. Um, and you can use them to build your basic chassis or give the body shape. Uh, on top of that you have various classes of wheels, engines that make it faster, more powerful, grippier, and then just lots of cool gadgets and that sort of stuff. And then yeah, you can just basically build, put anything anywhere and it's almost unlimited what you can do and it will perform roughly how you think it should when you put it together. If players wanted to opt out of vehicle creation, they could instead purchase blueprints for pre-made vehicles from Humba Wumba. Banjo-Kazooie and Gruntilda were joined by many familiar characters from past games along with new faces to the series. Showdown Town served as the game's hub world where players could access the new levels such as Nutty Acres, Logbox 720, Banjo Land, Gigaseum, and Terrarium of Terror. By exploring the worlds and completing their challenges, Banjo and Kazooie would collect the familiar jiggies and musical notes to access the next available level. There was also a side mission featuring Klungo, Gruntilda's former minion who has since changed his ways to design his own video games where he plays the hero. Outside the single player game, there was an online multiplayer mode where players could compete with others using their custom built vehicles and competitions modeled off the challenges in the main game. Trying to make um, people's own inventiveness the key to beating challenges and beating challenges better than other people. You can just have fun in a multiplayer lobby where there's eight of you messing around. You can just, with, with those crazy vehicles some people have come up with, you, you just start inventing weird game modes and just play on yourself. Game modes that aren't even supported properly in the game. But it's just fun to download video replays and blueprints of the best achieving vehicles on the leaderboards so you can see what people were doing the challenges with and how they were doing it. The game soundtrack was composed by another veteran of the series, Grant Kirkhope, with contributions from Robin Beanland and David Klinick. In March of 2009, Rare released downloadable content for the game in the form of Logs Lost Challenges, which added more modes and content to the game. The response for Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts from critics were mostly positive, but ultimately not as unanimous as the previous two console games. This new take on the Banjo-Kazooie series was welcomed by those unfamiliar with the older games, but not so easily by those who were. Newcomers enjoyed the vehicle creation mode, which offered a high replay value to the game, 
while others found it to be too complicated and cumbersome to be utilized on such a frequent basis. The game's graphical presentation, orchestral score, and signature humor were all praised, but the same wasn't said as much of the mission variety available. Nuts and Bolts came off even more divisive among fans of the series. While there were some who enjoyed it and appreciated the new direction, the majority of the fans despised the game's departure from its roots and wanted the game to be a more traditional platformer like on the Nintendo 64. Unfortunately, these conflicting reactions among fans and critics didn't result in impressive sales. Even at a starting budget price, Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts only sold around 140,000 copies in North America by the end of the year, and would later sell around 700,000 worldwide. While it sold enough to be considered for the Xbox 360's Platinum Hits lineup and Games On Demand, it was reportedly considered not enough for Microsoft and Rare to warrant a follow-up to the game. Since the release of Nuts and Bolts, Banjo and Kazooie haven't appeared in another new game with the exception of a cameo appearance in Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing in 2010. While the chances of the duo appearing in another new game anytime soon appear slim, their presence in video games continues to be cherished by their fans. The series was originally marketed as the company's spiritual successor to Donkey Kong Country, and for many players, Rare succeeded because Banjo Kazooie embodied what they loved about that franchise but on a grander scale. What they had previously done with Donkey Kong Country as a 2D platformer, Banjo Kazooie achieved and surpassed as a 3D platformer. They refined and built upon what had been well established in similar games, and while some may still criticize it for being just a carbon copy of other games, one could argue that Rare made it their own by bringing the same brand of character and innovation that have always made their games stand out from their contemporaries. What began as an ambitious look back to the roots of the company has evolved to become indicative of what Rare is best known for by its longtime fans. Charming characters, unforgettable worlds, and captivating music that all share a level of quality that is not often outdone. Knock on the screen, giggle with glee. Uh -huh. He's a bear who wears a necklace, sort of sweet and sort of reckless, wears a bag and doesn't hide it, keeps a little bird inside it. Banjo Kazooie, Banjo Kazooie. Here's your books to conquer until there's fun with him with Super Impel, the kid that Banjo's his duty with the planet Stiller Beauty. I want to play Banjo Kazooie. This is Kazooie, she can talk with bird words, this yellow backpack's full of a bird turd. Banjo Kazooie. Banjo, 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 Banjo. This guy is mumbo, he can make it big a little from what I hear, he plays a silent phone and fiddle. Play that fiddle, play that fiddle, I could go for a the cradle. Here we got a bird with small but smart legs, kinda funny how she coughs and farts next. Both of her holes have eggs coming out, that can't be healthy. Play that fucking fiddle, mumbo, play that fucking fiddle, mumbo. Play Joe Kazooie, play Joe Kazooie. Play that fucking fiddle, mumbo, play that fucking fiddle, mumbo. I want to play banjo Kazooie. Fight with the carrot, kick it with the turtle fire, banjo the bear with questionable day attire. Is she a parrot? What a fucking game. Ow! Next time in part 6 of this Rare Retrospective, Rare creates a new franchise inspired by their love of science fiction and set in the far reaches of outer space. Their next game would have players partake in the adventures of an elite military organization fighting a seemingly feudal war against an evil tyrant and his army of robotic insects. <laughs>